Good evening, everyone. My name is Pauline McIntosh, and on behalf of St. Francis Xavier University, I would like to welcome you to the Affordable Housing in Nova Scotia and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals webinar series. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered this evening in Mi'kma'ki, the unceded and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This treaty, this territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, and we are all grateful to be treaty people. Knowing there are people joining us from other ancestral and unceded territories uh, this evening, I would certainly like to recognize these territories as well. The webinar is sponsored by Employment and Social Development Canada, and we are very grateful for the support. I am very pleased to welcome our speakers, Ramsey Cower, Natalie Leonard, and Ross Ch Chapin. Thanks to each of you for agreeing to being with us here this evening. Your time and participation are greatly appreciated. Without further ado, I will welcome our first speaker, Ramsey Cower, to the mic. Ramsey holds a master's degree in architecture from the University of California at Berkeley. He is a licensed architect with the Nova Scotia Association of Architects, a lead accredited professional, a certified management consultant, and a certified new urbanist. He has over 40 years of international exposure and strategic consulting experience in architecture, affordable housing, physical and community planning, and innovative business development. Before moving to Canada from Jordan, Ramsey led Community Development Group, an award-winning multidisciplinary consulting firm, and was the country coordinator for UN Habitat Agenda. He has worked in Halifax since 2007 with local and international firms before joining Housing Nova Scotia in 2014, where he is currently the Director of Greening and Sustainable Business Practices. Since 2009, Ramsey has been teaching the International Sustainable Development Graduate Seminar at Dalhousie School of Architecture and Planning, which explores the role of architects in sustainable development, regenerative cities, and design activism. So I'm very, very pleased to welcome Ramsey this evening uh, to be our first speaker related to community planning and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Welcome, Ramsey. Thank you, Pauline. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I really appreciate the, the opportunity to share some uh, the insights and experiences that we've had at Housing Nova Scotia, um, specifically uh, uh, in the greening and sustainable business practices. Next, please. So as everybody knows, the five uh, uh, interconnected goals, poverty, no poverty, uh, good health, affordable and clean energy, uh, re uh, reduced inequalities and sustainable cities and communities. The, these relationships have been established and uh, moving forward, please. Uh, just a quick snapshot uh, of the uh, SDG timeline. Uh, the UN Millennium Development Goals started in 2000 and they ended in 2015, at which time the, um, the, uh, uh, sustain the Sustainable Development Goals uh, were established to reach the 17 goals uh, by 2030. Next. So in this, um, I would like to emphasize like these goals and how they interact with community planning, the built environment, affordable housing. So as we know, poverty, uh, the major issue that uh, affects the basic goal is that community planning can affect the impact of poverty on people's lives through access to housing institutions that are affordable. I won't read each one of them, but the one I'm going to be focusing on tonight is uh, goal seven, which is to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. And as we know, the major issue is that the built environment is a major source of energy consumption and a potentially crucial energy producer. Next, please. 
So housing Nova Scotia has a lot of challenges. Um, essentially, the uh, major issue is that our stock is all, the majority of it has been built before uh, 1978. And so uh, it's an aging stock. It was built with the uh, code of the day, not necessarily uh, up to what we have today, which is the uh, 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 higher energy code and, and so on. Next, please. The other, um, the other challenge is that uh, the majority of the units are um, for uh, older people, seniors, uh, uh, and therefore, we have the 65% um, uh, uh, by the asset types. And so those, those are buildings that uh, house mostly uh, families and, and seniors. Next, please. So the majority, 93% uh, of total energy came from public housing and the majority of it is oil next to electricity, propane, and natural gas. Yes, next, please. So I won't go into this. This is the, to, to say that 0.5% of the provincial total energy in GHG, sorry, uh, is coming from housing in Nova Scotia. Next, please. And in 2020, the, the utility cost was 21.7 million. Next, please. This is a timeline of the initiatives that Housing Nova Scotia uh, took upon itself beginning in uh, 20, uh, 2008, sorry. And beginning in 2008, we had what was called the uh, greening strategy and it addressed several uh, uh, actions that uh, were aimed to reduce energy. When I joined in 2014, we started something called the Energy Reduction Initiative. And we, um, we started planning for the first passive house. Uh, and then we signed an MOU with Efficiency Nova Scotia. In 2016, the first passive house was completed. In 2017, two more passive houses were completed. And in 20, uh, I'm just gonna skip to uh, 2020, we had the first draft of an energy management strategy. And then in 2021, we have the, the uh, energy management strategy approved, which is a five-year strategy between to 2026. Next, please. And those are some of the actions there. Um, I won't go into them, but these, these actions were uh, what we did under the greening strategy and under the energy initiative, uh, reduction initiative. Next, please. So in the gist of it is that between the, the two, uh, between 2007, 2015, uh, about 10% of, 8% uh, re uh, uh, reduction in energy was uh, the, uh, the total of percentage change. So actually the initiatives are working and we are reducing our energy footprint. Next, please. Very quickly, we built the first passive house, uh, affordable passive house in Canada. Thanks to Natalie Leonard, uh, who was our consultant on that, we were able to get it certified. It's about uh, 1,600 square feet per unit. Uh, re re energy reduction was 63% over code and uh, annual savings around $6,000 and 25 tons of CO2 equivalent uh, per year uh, reduced. Next, please. Next, we built uh, another duplex in Amherst. Um, and uh, again, it had some uh, reductions. And next one. We did the heap in Hebron, a multi-unit uh, multi uh, building, uh, which was, uh, sitting vacant for a long time and we renovated it again thanks to uh, Natalie's team and it got certified and the savings were in the range of 37 percent and the costs uh, 9,000 uh, annually. Next please. So uh, in uh, 2019, uh, 2018 I think 
uh, you can see now uh, to 2023, we have this uh, investing the ICIP project, which is a $22 uh, million cost sharing program. And it included envelope upgrades, net zero pilots, attic insulation, PVs, and heat pumps. Next. So then we have now ongoing uh, uh, a retro, deep retrofit project in Cape Breton of $8 million for around 20, 226, the one and two units, which are typically not included in the capital asset management program. So we were able to uh, get funding from uh, local and federal uh, uh, sources to do upgrades, electrification, fuel switching, uh, using ducted heat pumps and electrifying the water heaters. Next, please. <clears throat> so in 2021, as I said, the energy management strategy was confirmed, was approved, uh, and it had really three main targets to reach net zero by 2050 uh, emissions, uh, alignment with the Sustainable Development Goals Act, of 53% in GHG emissions below 2005 by 2030. And 2026, we thought would be the targets established through the, uh, the strategy. So we had four streams, energy efficient buildings, continued commitment to energy management, innovative funding and finance, and measurement and reporting. Next, please. Uh, and then the strategy aligned itself with the national and provincial uh, strategies and uh, essentially, uh, or SDGs, uh, the 53% and net zero. And then we have Bill 57 of 2021, which is the Environmental Goal and Climate Change Reduction Act, which also requires that any new buildings uh, or major retrofits in government, including schools, hospitals that enter the planning stage after 2022 to be net zero energy performance and climate resilient. So um, the uh, uh, the uh, sustain the initiatives driving sustainable prosperity in Nova Scotia actually recognized housing Nova Scotia's contributions in their publication. Next, please. Uh, other potential initiatives we have. Uh, the HCI3, which is uh, looking at the feasibility of doing a solar garden and EV study with uh, NSCC, low carbon fund, a federal program to hope to get $3 million for uh, PVs, uh, Department of Energy and uh, Environment and Climate Change, $40 million for provincial deep energy retrofits, uh, CMHC, 30 million co-investment for greening of 900 units, and NRCAN, 1.5 million for net zero projects. All of, the, all of these are potentials. We're in the process of uh, tracking them. And finally, thank you. I hope that was uh, within the time. <laughs> oh, that's fine, Ramsey. Thank you so much. You have provided us with a lot of information about um, greening efforts and um, and how they're working toward creating net zero in various parts of the province and, and to see the, uh, the, the, the benefits realized from taking that approach. Thank you so much. I'm sure there'll be questions for you as we move forward. And I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our second presenter this evening, who is Natalie Leonard. And Natalie is the first certified passive house consultant and certified passive house builder in Canada. Her mission is to make sustainable high performance homes affordable for everyone. She leads the passive design solutions team with a depth of experience in creating cost effective, beautiful and ultra efficient homes. Natalie brings her engineering background, hands-on design and construction experience, and a practical approach to building. Natalie, I'm really excited to hear what you're going to share with us this evening. Welcome to the, to the webinar. Thank you, Pauline. That's great. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to present a project that I'm really excited about. So this is the uh, Sunflower uh, Court Housing Project uh, for Women and Children. And the, the presentation I'm going to talk about tonight is how to build fast, cost-effective, net-zero passive, passive housing. 
and uh, with 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 a uh, a focus on how it meets the SDGs that that we're looking at from the United Nations. So. Um, for this audience, there may not be a, a whole lot of knowledge about what a passive house is or what net zero is, and uh, Ramsey um, covered some of the passive house projects that have been happening in Nova Scotia. So just let me um, give you a very quick uh, overview. So a passive house is basically a super insulated building, and the, the, the process is around optimizing the building envelope or the shell to reduce those transmission losses in our very heating dominated climate. Uh, and once we've taken care of, of that, then we can add very efficient mechanical systems. So typically a passive house on the coldest night of the year could be heated with the equivalent heat of a couple hair dryers. So that's the level of efficiency we're talking about. Net zero then means taking a passive house and adding enough solar panels, usually it's solar panels because it's the most cost effective um, renewable energy technology that we have on this scale, and uh, adding those solar panels to the roof so that the building is generating as much energy as it uses annually. So in the winter, it's going to use more energy, and in the summertime, um, we're going to sell energy back into the grid. So this project uh, is fairly significantly large um, project team. The client is add some uh, for women and children, not for profit. Affordable Housing Nova Scotia Association uh, was the project coordination and brought the project together. Uh, we worked in the architecture and uh, energy consulting. And then we had a number of engineers and other consultants that provided the necessary um, input technically for the, for the project and Dora Construction uh, was the builder on the project. And for those who don't know Adsom House, it is a, um, a not-for-profit organization that's been around for a long time. Um, they house um, several hundred people a year, and they really have worked to provide a, a lot of community support around housing. So not just providing the house, but also um, helping with food, clothing, connections, um, life skills, and um, it's mainly focused around women and children that are at risk, um, uh, domestic abuse and violence, uh, homelessness. So it's a really underserved population, and uh, we were really um, honored to be part of this, this specific project. So our team, Ramsey mentioned, Passive Design Solutions, we're a design firm here in Halifax, and the only work we do is on Passive House Net Zero um, projects. And we do a lot of custom design for affordable housing. We also have developed a, a series of Passive House stock plans for single family housing. We do a lot of energy consulting and try to provide uh, construction support and training to help move up the level of knowledge amongst the trades. Um, we've worked on about 250 passive house projects now to date over the, the 13 years that we've been doing this work. So back to the project, um, this land was donated by our HRM. It was an old school project uh, property. You can you can see it there on, on, the, on, the, on the photo. Um, and so it was a brown site, it was already utilized. Uh, the organization was fortunate to receive four million for from the federal rapid housing initiative. Uh, the total project cost was seven million, so they did need private donors and other government funding to reach the total project um, budget. And um, the rapid housing initi initiative required that uh, panelization or modular construction was part of the project, and a completion date uh, set at March thirty first. Um, it was a really short uh, time frame. Uh, quite difficult, actually, to to achieve the design and construction within the timelines. Efficiency Nova Scotia is providing. I think it worked out to about seventy thousand in rebates for the efficiencies uh, of the five buildings. And the project was quite challenged by uh, COVID cost increases and and COVID um, labor shortages and and delays. So we'll see that a little bit as we go. Um, the project goals, and I've related them here to the SDGs, um, there's 25 residential units, four of those are fully accessible units, all of the main floor units are what we call adaptable accessibility, so not full, full wheelchair accessibility, but adaptable for aging in place, and they were for, for women and children at risk. 
we wanted the spaces to be really warm and bright. The current spaces that they were had were very dark and, and uh, drafty and cold. There's also office space and a community center that supports the housing. It needed to be affordable. Uh, and it all, the affordability both on the construction costs and on the operational costs. So one of the reasons that that adds some and a hands targeted using the passive house approach and going to full net zero with this project was it, it is often easier to um, find capital money for these types of projects than it is operated operational funding for NGOs to to maintain these projects over time. So net zero means that they won't have an energy bill um, ongoing on the project, which allows them to keep that the, the rents extremely low. I think it's about 30% of regular market is, is the rent cap. Uh, they wanted durability again to reduce their operational costs. And a really key uh, focus was to foster security and community. So these are um, our clients moving into these units that have um, suffered violence and abuse. Um, so the idea that we were building a community that could look out for each other. And uh, we did that with a central courtyard and a playground as a focal point. Um, the project is fenced and, um, and everybody can look out for each other. And although there's a little piece of probably many more of the SDGs within this project, the, the ones that I highlighted are, are good health, um, promoting well-being, and certainly safe housing um, contributes to the well-being uh, of the um, tenants in this project. Gender equality, uh, empowering women to, to have uh, control over their own housing, and also with the um, community focus and, and um, skills development, it's contributing to this as well. Uh, affordable and clean energy um, that by bringing the project all the way to net zero, that uh, ensures affordability over um, time with the project. They won't be impacted by increased energy costs over time. And also climate action, it, part of that uh, energy efficiency as well. So Ramsey alluded to this, but about 50% of all energy unit use in buildings in Canada um, of all energy use in Canada is used by buildings. So building net zero, uh, we're, we're actually making a 100% reduction in the energy use needed by these buildings um, does have a, a, an impact on our goals towards the climate action change. Uh, peace, justice and strong institutions. Obviously we're not impacting institutions, but providing a, um, a safe, and um, a peaceful residence where they don't have to live in fear of abuse and violence will contribute to this goal as well. So the design strategy is just to dive in a little bit about how this project came together and, and how we thought about it. So um, we, we designed unit blocks so that we could comply with part nine of the National Building Code. And what that is, is the residential part of the code. And it's a it's a, a simpler code to comply with. You don't need sprinklers. There's not as much uh, fire codes and other aspects that, that there is in um, the commercial uh, building code. We use very simple building shapes. They're not only are they cost effective to build, but they're also more energy efficient. We used a simple gable roof um, oriented north south. So we had um, a roof space for our solar panels. And the buildings were oriented uh, south, so uh, and the window design was oriented for for solar gain from where we could um, take advantage from uh, from it. You can see the it's a little bit busy, but this is the community center and four residential buildings with a variety of unit sizes to accommodate um, um, single people living alone and up to um, larger families. We use the energy model, uh, the passive house energy model exclusively to balance, you know, how far do we improve the building envelope before we start to apply solar panels to, to um, optimize the performance of the building. So on the right side, we see the energy used if we built this to the normal building code. And just note the scale that this total is about 165,000 kilowatt hours a year. Um, this is our 
our uh, final case and what 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 was built. So you can see that the 11, 111,000 kilowatt hours would have been used for space heating, and we reduced that down to 60, uh, sorry, uh, 8,200 ish. So about a more than a 90% reduction in the need for for heating. And this green block shows the um, the uh, renewables that will make up all the energy use for the for the five buildings. So some of the things we use for cost control, we really want to be value driven. We want to spend the money on things that would add value to the community and save building costs as as uh, on things that wouldn't really add uh, value to the residents and community. So using our structural engineering to reduce the amount of concrete uh, makes the building more energy efficient, but also has less carbon um, uh, embodied energy in its in its manufacturing. So concrete, glass, and steel are probably the the, the worst building materials for CO two emissions during manufacturing. Um, you know, we eliminated some of the the foundation walls needed, which again eliminated the amount of concrete and made it more efficient. And we used a really sim simple uh, roof design um, for cost effective and also to accommodate our solar panels. So the assemblies is fairly technical drawing, but just to give you an idea, um, the roof in these buildings has an R90 approximately um, uh, R value. We've done that with blown in cellulose, which is a local recycled manufactured material. Uh, code is around R60, so a significant um, improvement over code. We used a, a double stud wall construction for an R39 wall, and the building code is R27, uh, thereabouts. Um, we insulate the frost wall below the grade because that helps keep, keep the floor warm. And um, we also put double the amount of insulation required uh, under the slab um, related uh, compared to the building code. And this, um, this insulation on the slab is what adds a lot to the comfort. So you don't have that cold floor um, feeling because we didn't have, we used a very simple electric heating system and we didn't want uh, a comfort issue for the residents feeling that they had cold floors. So on the energy efficient side, we, we know that larger, we, we see that larger buildings can use thinner assemblies than single family. So there is efficiency to building larger volumes um, for, for energy efficiency. We optimize the insulation levels in that balance with, with sol the cost of solar panels. So that was our, our sensitivity testing was how much would increasing the insulation save and how much would that uh, that if we didn't invest that cost in improving the building envelope, how much would it cost us to put solar panels on the roof to make up the energy um, difference? We used hot water heat pumps um, to, to make all the um, domestic hot water, which reduced the uh, hot water use by about half. We used a local passive house window manufacturer, so low transportation costs and good service. and um, we cut heat pumps for heating and cooling um, from the from the design uh, for budget reasons and also maintenance reasons. And so we had to really optimize the design to make sure that we were minimizing overheating and the need for air conditioning. So what did we learn in this project about how to build these kinds of projects? Um, what, the, one of the key things for me was there was really uh, in kind of a no ego, highly collaborative project team, everybody really working to from the builder to the client to all the consultants to, to make the best project at the best value we could. Uh, having smart sub consultants of structural and civil and electrical and mechanical engineers that are uh, willing to do things differently um, than the norm in code built buildings. Um, and work towards that solution is really important. Um, our bringing the experience of, of doing other passive house projects kind of eliminate um, the design options that won't be efficient really early on. So we don't waste a lot of time in the process getting, getting to, the, to the solutions that we need. 
And we use an energy model to, uh, and that's a, a software that compares different scenarios that allows us to um, decide which passive host strategies and to what level we need to take those strategies to be the most efficient um, in the building. So using an, ener an energy model is, is critical to that iterative design process. Uh, we limited the buildings to, uh, as we mentioned, part nine building code and also two-story blocks. So eliminating a lot of stairs and floor cassettes, which add to the cost. We used panelization in the construction, which helped on the timeline because they were being built the same time that the foundation and, and groundwork was being done. And we specified locally available materials and equipment um, wherever possible to, to um, have quick delivery times and also um, control cost. Uh, construction was slow. We had an oil leak on the property uh, that had to be remedied before it could continue. And then lots of COVID challenges with materials and labor, but we're happy to say that uh, on the 1st of September, half of the project was occupied in time for children to register in the school district. So it took a little longer than we wanted, but uh, it is finished and, and occupied um, and a successful project all round. So that's the end for me. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much, Natalie. It's really interesting to, to hear uh, you dive a little bit deeper in one project and unpack it for us to show where the uh, where the intersection with your work and the SDGs actually occurred. And I'm sure there will be questions when we get to uh, some open discussion a little bit later in the program. Uh, for now, I would really like to take the opportunity to welcome Ross Chapman to the mic. Ross is an architect based on Whipty Island in Washington State, and he is the author of Pocket Neighborhoods, Creating Small-Scale Community in a Large-Scale World. Over the last 25 years, Ross has designed and partnered in developing seven pocket neighborhoods in the Puget Sound region, Small, these are small groupings of homes around a shared commons and has designed more than 150 communities for developers across the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom. Welcome, Ross. Hey, thank you. What a pleasure being a part of this conversation. And uh, I always uh, am learning a lot. And Natalie, your, your uh, uh, project that you shared is so inspiring. I look forward to looking at it further and seeing how I can integrate that into my, my projects. I'm going to bring in a, uh, another angle in the, in the conversation. Um, and I, uh, I want to say yes to all of the efforts around energy and all of those um, aspects and how we can deliver uh, quality homes uh, in our communities that use far less energy so we can you know, lessen our, our impact. My antenna has been up for uh, the social dimension and then the, the equity dimension, uh, affordable housing. Uh, I've been working on something called pocket neighborhoods for the last uh, many, many years. And um, when we take a look at uh, how we create our built environments, we're often thinking about the, uh, the scale of economies and efficiencies. But when you look at how people gather, we gather in small groups. Uh, we love to chat, we love to tell stories, we reminisce, argue, laugh. In conversations, in small groups, conversation is, uh, is spontaneous. It just happens. So these people are gathered at a table, um, but look at where the conversations are happening. Uh, two or three people to either side across the table. There might be a conversation among the whole group, but it's most likely that somebody call, will call everybody together raise a toast, sing happy birthday. But when the conversation just goes on from there, it's in small groups. Pocket neighborhoods are designed around this idea of the scale of sociability. Um, uh, thinking about the scale of those right around us across the way. Uh, think four to 10 to 12 units total um, with, um, and these kind of groups um, gathering just happens as the daily flow of, of life happens. As the project gets larger, the site gets larger, the sociability stays small. 
working on a project with affordable housing in Hilo, Hawaii. We've got 90 homes and they are all in sociable clusters. Now, a pocket neighborhood might be a little confusing. So take a look at a neighborhood and then we'll look at pocket neighborhood. So in a neighborhood, you might think of it as several hundred houses. You're gonna know uh, some of your neighbors, but of course not all of them. A neighborhood is known by the landmarks in a neighborhood. You know, I'm the, the, uh, the house with a red roof uh, on it. Uh, I'm the house next to the park, that kind of thing. In a pocket neighborhood, neighbors are on a first name basis. They're the ones to first notice a need or to ask for help. If you've got uh, a single person and you, you're leaving uh, on a vacation, your cat's gonna have somebody to look after it easily. Uh, you're a single mom, you just got back from the grocery store, your child's asleep, oh my God, forgot my purse. Um, you're covered, you've got a nearby neighbor either to look after your daughter or to um, uh, go out and get the purse, it happens. I visited this fellow in a pocket neighborhood. He was thinking about getting up and cleaning the leaves off the roof and the, the younger guy across the way said, Joe, uh-uh, no, 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 don't do that, I can, I can help you. In a nearby neighborhood uh, that's close, that's closely knit, these things happen spontaneously. Typically, the development is not thinking about sociability. We think about privacy. We've got the public street, the private backyard. There's very little in between. Where do you live? Well, I live on a street of garage doors. In a pocket neighborhood, there's this, there is the um, intermediate space between public and private. Uh, and so you come out of your door to your porch and then into a safe zone beyond that. This is the space for nodding hellos, for the chats on the porch that happen, part of the daily flow of life. The casual conversations grow perhaps into caring uh, relationships and a sense of community fostered by the fact that you've got shared space. Kids, think about it now. You know, a, a, a child going outside the front door uh, is a cause for panic. Where's, where's Natalie? Where's, where's Joey? Where are they? And in a pocket neighborhood, they can go out and they can play freely. And as well, uh, someone who might be, um, you know, an older person who might possibly fall will know that there are others around just to be, be aware, to notice what's around. So pocket neighborhoods are pockets of nearby neighbors. Just an example of some uh, of this taking part in, uh, in the world. We're working with a, a group in Skagway, Alaska. And here we've got two sites and we have um, a real need for affordable homes. Uh, this is getting into something else. This is looking at how do we get households that come together with privacy and community. And what we did was to bring together two, two buildings nine households around a commons. This is what it looks like from the street, fits in, there's the commons, everybody has porches, cars are to the side. We're working with uh, another group on uh, uh, housing for people who are homeless here in our town and they, uh, there's a group that bought this older home. It's been uh, renovated, insulated, and a family lives there, the manager lives there. And then there are a series of uh, small homes that are in clusters, sociable clusters. These are simple homes, tiny homes for one, one person typically, sometimes two, we've got different versions that are a little bit larger. And this is another uh, project. Uh, we've got 51 homes, assisted living, uh, independent living homes, uh, a lot of professional and personal services meals on wheels, other things. But when we take a look at how, of what's going on, uh, all of the, the groupings are set up in these small sociable clusters. This is uh, under construction right now. And uh, here you can see homes for elders primarily, room size porches, and cars are to the side clustered, engaged. And a lot of this information is um, 
given in the book that I've written called Pocket Neighborhoods. You can look also at um, pocketneighborhoods.net and also rosschapin.com. So these are some of the ideas that we are exploring. And um, I think that when we take a look at uh, efficiencies of construction of energy and so forth, um, who is it that lives in the homes? Um, how is it that we find a way to have a place that is feels safe for oneself, for one's family? Uh, if your housing stressed, uh, financially stressed, it's oftentimes going to be very difficult to go out and engage in the world. The world is, may feel like it's going to be oppressive. If we can find a place for supportive community, find a place where we feel like we can be safe, uh, where children can be safe, where we can be there, then we'll find ourselves uh, calmed and in places that feel more like home, a real community where we can offer ourselves and our gifts to the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ross. It's really exciting to look at pocket neighborhoods. Um, I think it's, it's probably not... Uh, you, you, I think you've offered us a different lens through which to look at, uh, at, at the communities that we currently live in and, and, uh, and see around us. So it's really, really helpful uh, to look at pocket neighborhoods as an alternative way to form community. So thanks so much for sharing that. And I'm, I'm really curious to hear the, the conversation that will, that will follow. We have some time for some questions, and, and I just found one over in Q&A. Uh, but we do have a question from one person who's asking, from a sustainable community perspective, was there any conversation about food security, rainwater capturing, or community gardens? And I think that all, all three of our speakers could, could perhaps address this one. Ramsey, shall we start with you? And then we'll move to Natalie. Yes, no, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's a good question. We do have in some of our, um, in several of our community uh, projects where like the Mulgrave Park, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the larger, if you want, uh, community houses where we have many, several uh, units, we do have uh, community gardens and we have, dedicated land for that and we support that right uh, when we tried to do it on a larger scale we ran into some issues I mean, we, we reached out to the Truro campus of Dalhousie and um, and but that we, we we shelved it for the time being because but land is very um, you know rare I mean very um, not not very much available to do a larger, but we do have these uh, community gardens in in uh, in some of our uh, buildings, our projects. Right. Thanks, Ramsey. Natalie, were these considerations for Adsum when you were um, designing designing the new home construction uh, for that organization? Yeah, we did talk about community gardens, and um, there was a. Uh, of a, a consensus that that it may be more than than can undertaken um, immediately by by this population. Mm -hmm. um, the food security it, it is dealt with more through the community center, where they they bring they bring in food and donations through the community center. They give cooking lessons, um, and they're they're trying to support. Um, you know, good eating and, and providing quality food th through their programs in the community center. Um, uh, rainwater capture is really interesting. We have lots of people that are that are interested in that and rain barrels are sort of a, a, a very simple um, solution. Um, but I think I think it it's just tough because we don't we live in such a a wet climate where drought just doesn't impact us very much. I mean, there is some areas in Nova Scotia where wells are, are, are have been um, really challenged this this particular summer, but in both of these projects, um, they have connections to to, to municipal services. Um, and and the, the next affordable housing project that we're working on, which is True North Crescent in, in Dartmouth, there is community gardens, um, uh, uh, in the architect, the landscape architecture of that project. Great, thanks, Natalie. And Ross, I can imagine that the shared space might be a great place for a community garden. 
Yes, it's actually a fantastic place. And that does happen. I worked with uh, taking a 16 unit, uh, fairly dilapidated um, or an older apartment unit and changed it into affordable homes that were home ownership. And uh, there almost every bit of land is used for uh, some kind of productive use. Uh, well, both the playground as well as food. I want to highlight, uh, there's a group nearby in Port Townsend, Washington, and years ago, they were trying to promote um, uh, gardening, community gardening. There were like three pea patch gardens in the town, and uh, they just weren't coming together. There was an organization that was really looking for food security, and they organized something at a higher level to coordinate with the suppliers, coordinate with uh, organization, with communications, with master gardening abilities. And they fostered self-organized community gardens. And uh, they provided funding for uh, fencing, for at cost materials at supply shops. Right now there are, I believe 40 community gardens in the community and they are self-organized. And so you bring the, the um, organization, not top down here, here's the place for community garden, or here's your food, eat well. You're empowering them, engaging them to go from the ground up. And that's the approach that we are looking at with affordable homes as well. Uh, we're looking at how do we empower rather than give to and supply, how do we create opportunities for and empower people to engage uh, in a meaningful way in their own lives as part of a, a whole framework that we're trying to explore and understand. Wonderful, wonderful. Ross, we've got a, a question here from Jordan McDonald, who's doing some great work in affordable housing on Prince Edward Island. And he's asking, uh, do you have examples for small towns populations of eight, 800 to 1,000 people. And uh, Courtney Dunsby, who's in Halifax, is, is building on Jordan's question and asking, could this be a model for smaller rural communities or is it more um, urban friendly in terms of pocket? Uh, the, the town that I live in is 1,100 people on an island. And um, what we did years ago was to recognize that the zoning in our town was essentially a suburban form. Larger homes, garage fronted homes, uh, streets end up to be no man's land. That's, that's zoning. What, what I worked on was working with the planner to give incentives to do smaller homes uh, around a community setting where the cars are corralled. So we created the new zoning ordinance and then I formed a uh, development company to build the first example. And we built eight homes on um, four lots on two thirds of an acre, eight homes on two thirds of an acre. And they sold for about half the cost of uh, homes that you'd find in the area. And uh, they were selling for uh, smaller homes, smaller households, one and two person households and small families. They have proven over the years to become very strong in terms of holding their value uh, and in fact, that's the problem on the other side. They're, they're too nice. They're too valuable. Uh, so we're looking right now at how do we provide permanently affordable homes given the pocket neighborhood setting that emphasizes better use of land, more effective use of land and privacy along with community. So how do we do that in a way that's permanently affordable? And have you had the experience, Ross, of, of creating pocket communities in places where there aren't munis municipal services that often require a larger footprint for the actual home? Uh, well, that, that would be uh, septic systems and you need land for that. Yeah. And you need you know, land that will perk and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you take a look at the cruise ships, the sewer systems on a cruise ship, you can fit inside this room. Why not a whole community, uh, a pocket neighborhood with that? That's at, a, that's at a policy level and a lot of testing is being done. There's a lot of progressive work that's being done, but not in our state. Maybe in Nova Scotia, maybe you guys are really ahead of the game. Who knows? We have another question uh, from, oh, sorry, Natalie, would oh, you like to- I was gonna build on, on what Ross was saying. And, and I, I and for many municipalities, you know, we have R1 zoning 
you're, if you're lucky, R2 zoning on lots, which means you can only put a single family or a duplex on a piece of property, um, which is which is extremely limiting. And, and also um, Nova Scotia's environmental requirements, Department of Environment requirements of, se of septic are also very, very uh, structured and limited. So, so there's definitely some work to do on the um, policy level to be able to um, employ these these um, types of projects without without services, you know, without municipal services. Um, but it's it's such a great way to use resources. So I I, I hope we're moving in those directions from a policy perspective. Great, thank you, thank you. We've got only only five minutes left and still quite a few questions in chat. So perhaps we'll move to the next one, which is from Juanetta Fisher. This is a question around land usage with passive housing in mind. How do you maximize the space slash land available with building passive spaces? Everything being built in these scenarios is one story. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll uh, comment first. Um, the, the buildings that we built at Adsum are two-story. The buildings that we're building at True North are, are three-story buildings. Um, different building types kind of fit different needs of, of the, the, the tenants. And, um, and we're trying to respond to where South is and utilize um, passive solar wherever possible. Um, but a passive solar building, that, you know, is not limited. You can build a. There's one in New York, I think, that's about 80 stories. So it's not limited to a single story um, type of construction. Um, single story is very valuable for aging in place and accessibility. Um, but actually, larger buildings are more efficient just by nature that they have a a larger volume for the surface area that they're they're losing heat from. So. It, you can you and m mostly it's 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 zoning regulations around lot coverage that determine um, what you can do. We're working on a project right now in Yarmouth that ha has a certain lot coverage and a maximum number of units, and you you um, we have trouble getting those those units on the lot without going up past three, three stories and impacting uh, the need for elevators and and fire exits, which add cost and maintenance to the projects. Okay, thanks, Natalie. We have got a question from one of our students here at St. Vex this evening, who's asking, is this model being looked at by any universities to inform student housing projects? So I wonder if, if either of the three of you have seen this kind of um, progressive thinking related to sustainability uh, begin to be implemented in the creation of university housing. Thank you Anna, for the question. Yeah, and I, I wonder if he if they're referring to um, the pocket neighborhoods uh, approach. Um, I can say that there's been a number of, of resi uh, student residents that have been built to the passive house standard in the, in the U.S. that I know of of projects, small and large, um, but uh, uh, but none that I know of yet in uh, in Nova Scotia. Just want to say that the uh, pocket neighborhood approach is ideal for university settings. Ideal, couldn't be better. Mm. When you take a look at people coming from elsewhere, you want to have uh, the sense of community among you know fellow students, but you also want to have a sense of privacy. And again, in small groups, uh, conversation is spontaneous. This is where we begin to form. Uh, our sense of our relationship to ourselves and the world at large. It doesn't happen, I mean, it happens in your university class settings, but where do you digest all that information? Where do you digest the information um, around what's going on in the world? This is through conversations across the table, um, around a living room, in small scale. And when they, you know, you've got places where that can happen easily, it will happen. We thank you, Ross. Uh, another one of our um, uh, viewers tonight is asking, is there a step-by-step -step planning and strategy model for a group such as ours? And this is a person who's talked about um, Valley Connect Outreach, a team here in the Annapolis Valley in Nova Scotia, whom, whom he says are licking their wounds after a failed project 
but this is encouraging to hear. We have a willingness in some capacity, but I expect it will be a while before we are ready again. Is there a step-by-step -step planning and strategy model? I mean, I can jump in. Uh, we do have now in, uh, with the, you know, with the new leadership, uh, Housing Nova Scotia as part of the government has a lot of new programs and a new focus and a new approach. Uh, I think even uh, one of the projects that uh, Natalie mentioned in uh, Yarmouth is part of this. Housing Nova Scotia is giving land to whoever, the community actually, not to, you know, both public, uh, sorry, nonprofit and private sector to build projects. And I believe that the step-by-step -step approach is really to identify these opportunities. And I would say uh, making uh, uh, joint ventures and participating with other groups. And to, in today's world, you know, the more the more you can work with, as as Ross said, you know, create a community uh, of people willing to work together. I think that's a that's a very basic step. And then, of course, financing. But I mean, today there there are so many opportunities to find uh, funding. I must say, you know, from the from the feds to the province to, and especially if it is related. And I have to say this: there's a huge focus on energy reduction. So I mean. If you can, um, you know, get your uh, ducks in a row and related to uh, an energy reduction project, the, F the Federation of Canadian Municipalities will fund the project from A to Z. Anyway. Ramsey, you've just provided me with a beautiful segue because next Wednesday evening in our webinar that will happen at the same time in the same place, we will be hosting guests from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to talk about their, their affordable housing, the Green Fund for Affordable Housing. So, so uh, folks, that the registration will be released uh, shortly after this webinar tonight, and please feel free to join us for that one as well. I'm sorry, Natalie, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, I was just going to add to, to Ramsey's for, for John and Andrew that um, AHANS is, is an organization that has been um, around for a long time and has a lot of experience. And, and my um, experience of them is that they're very willing to share um, you know, that, that process and steps and, and, and key, key things to take care of and pitfalls and um, and I, 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 I know many organizations that just call them up to say, hey, this is what we're thinking about. Can you can you help steer us? And they 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 do a lot of that just, you know, helping out. But they also have some consulting capacity to help the smaller NGOs that it's their first time. And there is there is a lot of different steps and complications to making those projects happen. And and they bring I think it's 30 years of experience to to that in Nova Scotia. So I would suggest it's the Affordable Housing Association of Nova Scotia. You can find find them uh, as a potential resource. Great. Thanks, Natalie. And I'm really aware that it's 8.03. We've gone a couple of minutes over. So I'd really like to take this opportunity uh, to thank our speakers this evening, Ramsey Cower, Natalie Leonard, and Ross Chapman for sharing with us your, um, your, your passion for building sustainable housing, building sustainable communities, building communities where people feel safe and connected and can live well and know that they're treating the planet well uh, in addition. So really, I, th I think that the stories you've shared have been inspiring. Uh, the information that you shared have, has been helpful. And I think our, uh, our listeners tonight have lots of places to go to do some more investigation and to learn more. And I think you've really brought home for us the connection between the Sustainable Development Goals and the work that we're doing here in Nova Scotia to create affordable housing solutions. Um, I often say that in my own uh, nonprofit housing organization, we don't necessarily sit around the boardroom table talking about the SDGs, but our work to create environmentally, socially, and financially sustainable homes is very, very connected. And sometimes it's really helpful to know that we're part of a larger global movement uh, that's trying to achieve something at a different scale. So thank you, uh, all three of you, for being here with us this evening. I really, really appreciate it. And I would also like to thank uh, some folks who are working behind the scenes, uh, Nancy O'Regan, Brian Lazuri, Jenny McDonald, and Sue Hawks 
who are colleagues here at Cody who've provided fantastic coordination and communication support uh, to make this evening's webinar happen. And finally, I would certainly like to thank Employment and Social Development Canada once again for its sponsorship of this event. And as I just mentioned, we've got another webinar coming up next Wednesday evening where we will be hosting um, uh, representatives from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And then the following four Wednesdays, we're gonna be hosting two hour virtual workshops. And these workshops are called People Schools. And the People School starts with the knowledge of the people in the room, so whoever shows up. And we're gonna talk about affordable housing and health outcomes. We're gonna, and we're gonna talk about affordable housing and environmental sustainability. And we will welcome Ramsey back with us for that People School. We will have a third People School on affordable housing and diversity, equity, inclusion, and decolonization. And a final people school on affordable housing and the role of municipal government. So please stay tuned. Uh, keep your eye open for the registration links for all of these events. And uh, we'll continue in our collective journey to expanding our knowledge and expertise as it relates to the UN SDGs and affordable housing here in our province of Nova Scotia. And with that, thank you all for tuning in this evening, and I hope to see more of you next Wednesday evening. Thanks, everyone. Good night.